campus. And uh, Marin Simon is joining us. I've only known one other Marin, <laughs> and <laughs> that Marin actually is a, a, a name that maybe our Baltimore and Maryland folks know. Um, Marin Alsop connects with the Baltimore Symphony. Beautiful name. Um, so Marin Simon, um, she works as a bereavement counselor with the Hospice of Northwest Ohio, and she's bringing us our topic today, which is navigating grief. And um, you know, the hospice world is very familiar with this, uh, with this topic and with this challenge, and um, the rest of us have become much, much more acquainted with it through COVID. And so the timing of this presentation, I think, is just really perfect. Um, Marin has, from Bowling Green State University, both a Bachelor of Science in Gerontology as well as a Master's in Social Work. So she brings an educational background that's perfect for our topic today, but she also uh, has personal family experience with hospice services, which I think always makes us much more, more um, sensitive and aware of the importance about supporting individuals and and their families, their caregivers um, in the end of life journey. So uh, with this road of grief that follows that and that so many of us have been on through COVID, this, as I said before, is just a perfect topic. So thanks, Maren, for joining us. And mm -hmm. I'll turn it now over to you. Great. Thank you, Catherine and Allison. And everyone, thank you for having me. Um, like she said, we're going to be talking about grief today. Um, navigating grief, what does it look like? How does it affect pe people? Um, what does it look like right now amidst COVID-19? Certainly has exacerbated grief issues. And when I work with folks, I work with um, folks in individual counseling as well as family counseling. We do some support groups. Um, for in a lot of various capacities. And a lot of them will describe to you grief as a long, strange journey, um, given the title. And it, long being, there's really no timeline for grief. It is not something that is a quick, easy fix. Strange and that strange literally means something that is hard to understand. It is hard to describe grief because you articulate it, give words to it, because of the experience that it is. And then journey in that it is not like the saying, it's not the destination, it's it's the road, every step ahead. And that there's not necessarily an end to it. Um, so we'll get started. So first and foremost, what is grief? Um, this might seem clear as a definition, but there's a couple of things I like to um, explain. So grief can be described as deep sorrow, usually though caused by somebody's death. And I, and I say that because grief can certainly be as a result of a loss, the death itself, but there can also be many other losses, much like what a lot of folks are experiencing right now with COVID. And I'll, I'll get to some of those additional losses later. Um, there's a book out there called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. And the author of that book describes grief as a natural response to deep loss, which is one of my preferred definitions of grief. Um, one in that it's very validating for folks who've experienced a loss that what they're feeling is only natural. It's only the, the natural human response to what love we have had for somebody that is no longer a part of our lives. And then grief is individualized. No one experience is the same. Um, there might be similarities, things that we can um, connect and resonate with one another about. But ultimately, our grief is as individualized and special to us as the relationship with the person that we lost. It impacts the whole person. It impacts us emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, you think it, it impacts it. Um, and then the next few slides, I'll talk more about all those different facets of how grief can impact a person. Now, the next two points, those are questions I'm asked frequently by folks. How long will this last? And what's normal? Which, I mean, what is normal? I'm not sure. Um, but how long does it last? Like I said, there's there's no timeline for grief. And, 
and it's not something to be fixed and therefore it's hard to say how long one will feel a certain way. Um, something that one of my support groups likes to say is that it doesn't necessarily get better, uh, despite that sometimes being an encouragement that people will share like, oh, it'll get better. They like to say it, it changes, it becomes different with time, um, but it will never pass completely because the love that we have for folks um, stays with us. And then I wanted to make a point, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, resilience. And, and I say that because we are far more resilient than we even know um, to cope with grief, to walk through it, to manage it, um, and, and know more now than ever just about what's available to us to cope um, and that we truly can come out on the other side with, you know, lots of different helps and supports, um, it is possible, okay? Now, I had mentioned the book, It's Okay That You're Not Okay. The author is Megan Devine, and this is actually one of the books featured on our book recommendation list, which is one of the resources available to you all um, from me today. Uh, definitely recommend this one. It's um, written most recently, and a lot of folks I work with have found it to be very, very helpful. And I wanted to share a brief quote with you from the book, um, just as I know that it can be helpful um, to just the everyday person trying to understand grief and how to support someone who is grieving. Um, and it's it, this excerpt's kind of just about what our culture and society views grief as. And I, I hope that it's a challenge to you. Um, so I'll, I'll read it for you. Our culture sees grief as a kind of malady, a terrifying, messy emotion that needs to be cleaned up and put behind us as soon as possible. As a result, we have outdated beliefs around how long grief should last and what it should look like. We see it as something to overcome, something to fix, rather than something to tend or support. Even our clinicians, folks like myself, are trained to see grief as a disorder rather than a natural response to deep loss. So I just encourage you to, to think about that, to ponder it. Um, when folks share with me just about how our society's view of grief has affected them, some of the most common things shared are, are, are the platitudes that surround grief, you know, well, at least you had them for as long as you did, or Everything happens for a reason. God has a plan. And what happens when we say those things, although well-intentioned, is that we're essentially, we're essentially dismissing how folks feel and kind of leaning into this idea that grief is something to be fixed or to clean up or that pain is uncomfortable rather than just allowing folks to sit with it, to feel it, knowing that feeling is healing and that that is actually far more supportive than um, some of the encouragements that we think that we're offering. So something to consider. So common grief reactions. I mentioned earlier that grief impacts the whole person. Um, this is another resource that you'll have available to you. Yours looks a little bit different. Um, I had to try to fit all of this on the slide. So yours is the, the more professional copy. Um, but I wanted to point out a few things amidst all of these bubbles. So like I said, grief impacts us physically, mentally, emotionally, behaviorally, and spiritually. So to start with the physical, just a few things to highlight. Um, I see a lot of folks that experience headaches and stomach aches, those are probably the most common um, sleep disturbances, either having a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep, you name it. Um, we always suggest folks definitely stay in touch with the doctor, don't always write things off to be related to grief, but certainly some of these things, if otherwise unexplainable, can be caused by grief itself. Um, mentally, you know, a state of confusion. Some folks like to call it grief brain, um, just a general fogginess. It's hard to stay focused, um, to stay organized. And then disbelief, it's 
another very popular, just a, a state of being shocked um, to go from one day to the next, having this person to not can just be so shocking to the system. Now, emotional in the bottom left corner, um, this is the majority of what I see folks really um, resonate with when they look at this sheet. Anger, uh, guilt, very, very common. Um, you hear guilt in the things that people say, like, I should have done this, or what would have happened if I had seen this symptom earlier, you know, say in, in a, the example of a long-term illness or a sudden cancer diagnosis, like what if, all the what ifs, that's guilt and regret. Um, numbness, sometimes folks, there's so much emotion that it's hard to even determine what it is. And, some, and sometimes that comes out and just like, I don't know what to feel, therefore I feel numb, quite literally. Behaviors, um, we see a lot of avoidance, uh, obviously crying, that's probably the most common thing just societally that we see with grief. We see that maybe more and we think that that's all that grief is. And now you see all of these other, other ways that grief can, and can react within someone. And spiritually, um, being angry with God, asking why big existential questions. Why does this happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Um, and just searching for meaning in those questions. This next slide, this is another handout you'll have. Um, I, I use this a lot with folks just to validate their experience. You know, sometimes folks reference the five stages of grief, which for time's sake, I, I won't go through today. Um, but what happens is folks will think, well, you know, I thought I was doing better, but now I feel angry again, or what have you. And in reality, grief looks so much more like the image on, on the right, like a tray of spaghetti, <laughs> where some days you might be feeling more hopeful, and the next day something just happens and you feel angry again, or you feel afraid, um, or the, the shock of things come at you once again. And, and so just know that it's not always this linear progression um, and that it can be so much more validating to think, okay, there's nothing wrong with me. If one day is good and the next day is bad, it doesn't mean I'm taking two steps back. Um, it can in fact mean I'm taking an inch back, but I'm, I've still made a lot of progress in, in regards to healing. So factors impacting grief, um, it's, there's so much to this slide. I'll, I'll try to be brief because um, I could just talk about it to the days long, but secondary losses, we'll start kind of at the top of this wheel on the right side. Secondary losses are those that come as a result of the death that somebody has experienced. Um, it, now, housing related, this is one thing that I've seen a lot of folks experience. As a result of a loss, there can be a loss of housing, a loss of income, loss of employment, maybe because they were acting as a caregiver um, or their income assets were related to the person that is now deceased, you name it. Um, loss of relationships, connections to um, family or friends of the person who died. Um, there, there can be so many. Other factors that impact one's grief experience is their personality. Um, you can think of this as simply as the saying of somebody being a glass half full or a glass half empty kind of person. Basically, what is the person's general disposition in life? And that can set them up for how they might grieve, how they might heal and move forward. Past experiences with death, um, is this the first loss somebody's experienced or is it one of many? Perhaps one of many in the last year. Worked with a lot of folks in, in 2020 and into 2021 that have not only experienced one loss, but maybe two or three. Um, and that can certainly paint a different picture for how they experience grief with any one particular loss. 
in addition to that, what have they learned from previous losses coping wise to help them now? What support system, what, what supports are available to someone, friends, family, coworkers? Uh, do they live locally or do they live out of state? And what kind of support do those people provide to them? Um, some folks are a great emotional support and are able to listen and, and be non-judgmental and, and just loving. And then others are more supportive than providing meals or, hey, can I do your laundry for you? Um, and it, it comes in different ways. Then current stressors, talk about, you know, amidst COVID-19 folks who are experiencing a loss, there are so many other stressors going on right now. Like I mentioned, if, if folks have different employment or loss of employment, say there's other things going on in the family, things going on in their job, um, their own medical health concerns, this list could go on and on. Circumstances surrounding the death, um, was the death anticipated? Say because somebody had a long-term illness or due to older age, or was it unexpected? Was it tragic um, due to suicide, homicide, drug overdose? You know, all of those things impact um, then how somebody will grieve. Cultural, ethnic, and religious. How do those inform the way somebody grieves, whether there are specific traditions and how different cultures um, approach one death and dying, but then to the bereavement process? Um, or do folks also have additional supports through those groups that they might be involved with? And then relationship with the dece deceased. Um, this probably, uh, uh, all of them are important, but this will ultimately drive you know, just the, the deepest impact of grief. Um, I like to tell folks that the relationship directly correlates to the grief that we have. Um, th there's a saying out there that says, grief is the price we pay for love. Um, that kind of helps paint the picture a little bit more. Um, but certainly the, the importance, the significance, the closeness of the relationship will impact um, their grief experience. Now, just quickly, I wanted to highlight, you know, the different parts of this wheel that have been impacted in the past year and a half um, as we've faced a global pandemic. Um, many of these have been exacerbated by COVID-19, um, increased isolation. Um, I, I mentioned various different secondary losses, um, not being able to be present with people as they die or in the hospital, what have you, um, has certainly impacted folks all the more. So what have we in the, in the hospice and bereavement community been seeing amidst COVID-19 in regards to grief? There are three main things that have um, been obvious to me. The first being cumul cumulative loss, excuse me. This means that people that are experiencing not only one loss, but multiple, and in a short amount of time, cumulative in that they, they just stack up one on top of the other, almost becomes difficult to focus on what do I grieve first? What, what do I give my attention and my energy to? And then secondary losses, we covered this in the previous, like, previous slide, um, one of which specific to COVID is a loss of normalcy in the assumptive world, which basically means what we kind of expect out of our day-to-day -day lives shifted greatly in the last year. And then collective grief. This is kind of transcends the grief related to death, to just the loss that we're all experiencing collectively as a society amidst COVID um, and experienced, experiencing prolonged trauma, not just a, a short term um, tragedy in our, in our history. This is being stretched out over a long period of time, which is important to note because that relates to how we then cope with something. Um, it, it 
asks much more of us um, to endure something long term than short. So rituals, these are uh, things that have been impacted by COVID, um, whether they're rituals surrounding um, how we support hospice families and, and the bereaved, but also around like the holidays and, and big events, gatherings, they've all been altered um, by, the, by the pandemic and what's been happening in the past year and a half or so. Um, funerals look so different now. Um, it, it has changed, you know, even just recently as numbers start to decline in regards to COVID, but folks having virtual funerals, um, different types of religious rituals, not being able to go to church, uh, mass, um, it, it looks very different. Um, maybe that's online, virtual. Um, being present at the time of death. This is hospice specific. Um, over the last year and a half, um, thankfully our agency is able to provide some more visitation for folks and families instead of um, having complete restrictions, but a lot of hospitals in the past year have had to do that. And it's certainly affected um, people's ability to, to be at the bedside, something that we would normally associate as being a possibility as somebody is declining and dying. And then holiday rituals, just gathering together, traveling to see family, being able to share meals and gifts. And I don't know what your holidays might have looked like this year, but I guarantee they in some way look different. Um, so how do we manage that? Um, I was asked very often prior to the holidays at the end of 2020, you know, what do we do? What do I do just to stay connected? What do I do that could still be meaningful? What do we do in the meantime when we can't do those things? And the first thing I would have folks focus on is acknowledge and grieve the loss. We can't just skip over it to, okay, we'll just do this. We first have to grieve the death itself, the loss of what we were familiar with and the normalcy of it and the comfort of that. And then after that, acknowledge and validate that there's not an equitable replacement for what we've lost out on amidst COVID, traditions wise, ritual wise. Um, yes, there are things that we can do, but they, like I said, aren't an equitable replacement. Um, one thing I've suggested to folks too, if you're supporting someone amidst these kind of difficult decisions, trying to still be supportive of one another, is to not to avoid saying, well, at least we're able to do X, Y, Z. At least the term at least can be very dismissive. Um, and that's why this acknowledgement and validation part is, is so essential. And then we land on, okay, what, what can be done in the meantime? What can be done to foster connection, to find meaning amidst loss? as we connect and try to have those same ways of finding closure, finding support amidst the bereavement process. Um, many of us have been well acquainted by now with Zoom, <laughs> staying connected virtually. Um, I know that I've taught many people just how to navigate the virtual world. Um, there's a lot of intimidation and fear with it. Um, it just, a lack of knowledge and so therefore using our resources um, to teach folks how to connect in that way. Uh, making memory slideshows and PowerPoints, things that you can share virtually and have different family members to participate in, provide pictures, um, cards and gift exchanges, um, using good old snail mail, send some cards, um, sharing gifts around the holidays still by mail. And then some kind of unique suggestions I've heard and have actually had clients use this, a remote scavenger hunt. Um, what this is, is, you know, say you gather around Zoom, or you gather on Zoom, excuse me, and there's prompts for, you know, pick something out of your house that reminds you of them or makes you laugh it is as you think about your loved one um, or that tells a story and then share that story. 
um, just gives a tangible way for, for folks to connect. Um, collective cooking. This has been a favorite among folks I've talked with. This would be gathering, say again on Zoom or even over the phone or, or not at all, but each different family member might be cooking that same meal that night, a way to be connected even from afar and choosing a recipe that was say special to their loved one. Um, I had a father and daughter pair recently make their, um, his wife, her mom, her chicken papakash recipe one night and they just shared it over Zoom and it was so, so meaningful. And then prioritizing basic needs, you know, eating, making sure you're eating throughout the day, drinking water, moving your body to some capacity doesn't mean you need to have some extravagant exercise routine, but just taking care of yourself, making sure you're sleeping at night. And then coping strategies, one of which, and we'll talk briefly um, just about general coping strategies for grief, but one kind of particular to what our experience has been throughout the pandemic and with grief combined is grounding, which just means helping our minds and our bodies to be more present in the moment, to kind of slow down and not be in the past and not be in the future, but just right in this moment. Um, one in which a specific one is called the 54321 breathing technique and you breathe through and you think about five things that I can see, four things I can feel or touch, three things that I can hear, two things that I can smell, and one thing that I can taste. And as we go through that, basically what it helps, it helps your brain to slow down and to come back to the moment. And then this next resource, this will be another handout you'll have. Unfortunately, it's not um, super clear just on the, the PowerPoint slide because it is um, smaller on the slide. So hopefully in your copy, you'll be able to see it much more clearly. This is something we used at our annual holiday, Coping with the Holiday Workshop um, at the end of 2020 and can also be used really in, in looking how to cope through any, any part of grief, not just the holidays. And on the front of the handout, it says creating a to-do list. It talks about the word prioritize as an acronym. And I'll leave that to you to read through, but basically it gives folks kind of a background of how do I make decisions in a way that would be most supportive to me to cope through something that I anticipate will be hard, will be difficult, like the holidays. You know, how do I face Christmas without them at the at the dining table and their spot being empty. What do I want to do? What's most important? And the list that it has you go through asks three questions, and that's the little part on the right of the screen. And using the prioritize acronym, you think through what things do I need to do? What has to be done? And then the second question, what would be nice to get done? Or what would I enjoy doing? And then the third is, what is just not necessary? And they use the word zany, meaning kind of wild. What would be zany to do? And I can let go of for the time being, or even just this year, and next year will look different. So coping with grief. Um, the next two slides are kind of a generalized coping strategies for grief. What can we practically do amidst grief to um, support ourselves, um, to heal, and to just move forward? Um, you'll notice I use the phrase move forward. I'm not a big fan of move on. It has somewhat of a negative connotation that I'll, a lot of folks share with me. So I tend to say, how do we move forward? Step by step, day by day. So the very first one, and I, I will always start with this, is give yourself permission. Give yourself permission to grieve, to feel, knowing that there are no shoulds or shouldn'ts. Like, I really shouldn't feel this way. Anytime somebody says the word should, I throw up a little red flag. <laughs> Let's highlight that and ask, well, who 
says that you shouldn't, you know, there, there aren't, there's not a rule book for grief. Um, and like we said earlier in the presentation, there's no timeline and everyone grieves differently. Second, uh, normalization and validation go very far uh, in regards to just general coping. So the, the slide talking about common grief reactions, I can't tell you the sigh of relief I hear in folks when they see that for the first time, because they finally see all these things that they can resonate with that they almost thought before that, like they were going crazy, because there's just so many emotions tied to grief um, that it can be very overwhelming prior to hearing somebody say, you know, you're not alone. Um, or in our support groups, people will say, Oh my gosh, me too. <laughs> and talk about just the sigh of relief that happens when you know that you're not the only one feeling that way. Social support, um, connecting with support groups, connecting with other people that you feel like you can share your grief experience and, and be validated in return. Um, seeking counseling support whether that's individual grief counseling or just generalized mental health counseling. Um, I always say that this is available to anybody. It doesn't have to be that you've reached a point where you're, you're thinking, gosh, I, I, things are just really bad and I need help. Honestly, anybody um, can benefit from counseling, um, even if it's just a, a space to share, to vent, to have somebody that's able to help you just navigate your thoughts and feelings can make a world of a difference. Um, can't tell you how often I hear folks say, you know, I really hesitated calling in and this is them, you know, five months down the road and saying, I'm so glad that I did. So always encourage folks to, to seek that support. Talking and sharing your story, just, just talking, like I said, with counseling support, and the sharing your story is meaningful and that, like we said, there's no true fix for grief, but there are, you know, like in these coping strategies, ways that help us just make sense of things, find meaning in the midst of sharing and telling your story and having someone bear witness to that. Journaling and writing, um, also another way that you can share a story by writing it out. Um, but also by writing memories that you never want to forget, writing out feelings when you're angry, just letting yourself free write. Um, another good writing practice is just in, in challenging ourselves to find gratitude and writing about that in a very specific way um, in, in great detail can, can drive us towards more and more gratitude, which is um, very important for coping. Mindfulness and relaxation. So I mentioned the five, four, three, two, one um, kind of meditation practice, um, but there are so many ways, um, and certainly a lot of resources on YouTube and apps and books on mindfulness and how we can be present to kind of slow ourselves down, center ourselves back to today, this moment. Um, which can be very helpful when grief can just cause you to live in the past, think of worry about the future, to just come back to right now. Um, stay busy. I, I put that in quotations because many folks will say, you know, in regards to what they've been doing to help, I'll just stay busy. I've been staying busy and that's helpful. And it gets a bad rap sometimes, but it can be helpful. Um, exercise, diet, and sleep spiritual disciplines and rituals. So being engaged in, in your, what you're involved in, um, prayer, meditation, whatever that might look for you, look like for you. And then memorializing and meaning making, um, which is about finding a way to stay connected with the person that it is that died in, in a meaningful way. Um, for example, I've had folks that say their, their loved one that died, died of a stroke. And, and later on, they decide, I really want to get involved in the American Heart Association and work with minorities and teaching them about high blood pressure and cholesterol. And that that is a way for them to find meaning amidst their loss because they're doing something impactful and important to them with it. So the 
resources for you to have in addition to the handouts. These are things that I like to say what's been speaking to me, um, some of which I've referenced throughout our talk. Um, a few podcasts by Brene Brown, who is also a social worker and researcher. Um, Speaking Grief is a documentary that came out in 2020. I highly, highly recommend. Um, it is available to the public now. Um, shares a lot of different stories of actual people's experience with grief um, and really helps articulate <laughs> even better um, what is so hard to articulate. And then Making Meaning Out of Grief is a New York Times article on the idea of meaning making. Um, and, and so it can be a further resource for you about that topic. So as we wrap up, just to um, hit on this point about hospice bereavement services, um, both ourselves at Hospice of Northwest Ohio, but the majority of any hospice agency that you might be connected with in your area, all of which through Medicare are required to provide at least 13 months of bereavement support um, to folks in, involved in their care previously. Um, with us at, at Hospice of Northwest Ohio, um, we also provide bereavement support to our community. So even folks that weren't connected to hospice, their loss wasn't on our program, um, we still provide our bereavement support to them. It is free of charge. Um, most provide different readings and resources, um, newsletters, information about grief, um, like I said earlier, our, our biggest supports are providing individual grief counseling and then our grief support groups. Um, and I listed what our groups are. Um, they have different um, focuses. I myself lead a group for folks that have lost a spouse or a partner. Um, then we have kind of a generalized coping with loss. Most recently, a group about COVID-19 loss, folks that have lost someone to COVID-19. And then mending grief with mindfulness is a more focused approach um, in mindfulness techniques to cope with grief. So that is it for me. Um, and I hope for time's sake, we're doing okay. Are there any questions that folks might have? I can pull up the chat or if um, Catherine Allison or someone would like to share with me because I don't know that I can see it right now. 